Leo Lozano, who is a professor at the University of Cincinnati, got his PhD in Clemson. Um, this is a ACP summer school. And so I think I can actually give a lesson to the students here. You should always travel to see people if you can. So me and uh, Leo got introduced because at some point we had, you know, overlapped in a conference and I had made the time to go visit him down in Clemson with Cole Smith, who was his advisor. And from there, we now have a bunch of research projects together, papers together. And I think that's how you expand your network, right? Go planned trips at different universities. And so I'm always very excited to hear what Leo has to say. Um, and so why don't you take it away? Awesome, David, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and yes, that, that was, it, it, it feels like yesterday, but it's been a few years of so many, so many fun stuff. Um, let me share my screen. And let me just, I would love to see. Can you see a chat at the same time? Chat, ah, okay. Awesome. So morning, everyone. Um, I'm I'm Leo Lozano, and I I want to share some ideas. Actually, uh, I, I everything I'm going to share today is from a collaboration we are working currently with uh, Andre and David, and um, it's a paper that hopefully is going to be out very 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 soon. So uh, a preprint is yet not available, but but within. Next time we meet, for sure that um, paper is going to be out there, and I think it's a perfect sequence to continue on on the topic. Um, uh, many of the ideas that Merv just introduced in in, in two stages stochastic or this multi-stage idea, um, we this is this is a, a direct continuation of of that type of of work. Uh, I I have a very short presentation, so I I just want to take my time. Please feel free to interrupt, to ask questions and what's not. Um, uh, so let's keep going. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to, to show you these ideas fresh out of the oven. So uh, first, let's try to, to, to spend a little bit of time understanding this setting of, of bi-level optimization. Uh, and it looks scary, but this, this has been going on in, in our field for a few years now. And you see this type of bi-level optimization problems in, in different settings. You, you can think of two-stage two stochastic programming. It's a special class of, of bi-level optimization or network interdiction, robust optimization. Many of these areas that, that, that we've been studying in the past 20 years, they, you can cast them, you can see them as special classes of bi-level programs. And in a very general setting, the idea with a bi-level optimization is, is like you have an optimization problem within an optimization problem formally. Uh, these are a type of uh, Stackelberg games. So you have two players that play sequentially and your two players are a leader and a follower. Um, in this formulation, this is a very general formulation in which um, I'm assuming that the leader is in control of a set of variables that I denote XL and the follower is in control of another subset of variables XF. So everything with an L is uh, control or regards to the leader. Everything with an F is control or regards the follower. Now, the structure of these problems is uh, you, you are solving this problem from the perspective of the leader. The leader is trying to maximize or minimize some objective and this objective, uh, both components are in, at, at play in here. So, there's a part of the objective that the leader can control and there's, there's, a, there's a contribution to the objective uh, linked with the leader variables, but there's also a part of the objective that is kind of out of the leader control. Like it's, it's something that the follower controls, for example, in, in two stages stochastic programming as Merf was showing, uh, you, you can think of the leader as the first stage. So there are some things that you decide on the first stage that you control right there. And then after the realization of the uncertainty, there's a recourse problem, there's a follower, there's something that is out of your control at that moment, okay? In the same way, um, we have a, what is called the upper level or, or the leader's problem, the, the set of constraints. Again, 
Uh, this set of constraints, they uh, may perfectly contain the leader variables and there's some coefficients and there's some actions that the leader can take uh, and can be limited by the constraints, but there's also an effect of the follower uh, decisions in here. And what makes this problem interesting is this little monster down here, this uh, constraint is actually saying, look, the follower vector, whatever the follower is going to do, it has to be an optimal solution to a follower problem. So this arc max is just a way of, we are, we are incorporating a follower optimization problem within the leader's uh, perspective. So leader has control of XL and then follower is going to be an optimal solution to a follower problem and this follower problem again, is going to have some sort of objective that could depend both of the leader and the follower. And it's going to have a set of constraints that uh, in the same way as the leader uh, is also here uh, dependent on the follower and the actions of the leader. So this is a, a very general setting. As I was telling you, the, the motivation for studying this type of problems is that uh, in special cases of this type of, of games are, the most well-known cases is, is robust optimization. Uh, in, in robust optimization, you have a leader making some decisions and then you can think as the, the realization, the worst case realization of the uncertainty from an uncertainty set, that's, that's, that would be the follower. Or in two-stage stochastic programming, you have a first stage that's a leader, you make some decisions and then you have a follower that uh, solves for each scenario some recourse problem. Or in network interdiction, usually you have a leader that is trying to interdict to, to make some attack into some components of a network or a system, and then a follower has to solve um, an, an auxiliary problem on the remaining component. So this, this has been in the literature in, in many different shapes. And um, after some initial and after some of the ideas that we've been using decision diagrams for two-stage stochastic programming, a natural evolution, a natural step is, is to go uh, to a, 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 this a little, a slightly more general setting and see uh, what types of ideas or what could decision diagrams do for us in this type of setting. Now, this is of course a very, very, very general setting. I want to focus on some, uh, some special cases of, of these bilevel problems and for the purpose of this talk, I, I just want to introduce one example and share some of the ideas we are exploring with that particular example. Of course, then in the paper, we, we will have a, a generalization of those ideas, but for the context today, I, I think it's perfect to just go over an example now. Before I move forward, I, I would like to stop here and, and see if you have any questions regarding this type of bi-level setting. It's, is this uh, is is the dynamic of this type of problem clear? Are we good to go? Are there any questions on the setup? Awesome! It feels just like teaching class. Um, no, this is the optimistic <laughs> approach, right? So you are allowed to choose one of the alternative optima, whichever you like. Yes. Oh, okay, that's a very good question. Thank you, Murph. Yeah. So in this case, we're saying the follower. It's any solution to the uh, argmax in here. So any optimal solution of the follower. And since here we have like, like in the outer, in the upper level, we, we have control of both variables. Yes, what actually is happening in here is what is known in the literature as an optimistic uh, assumption. And it's optimistic in the sense that if there are multiple al uh, alternative solutions to a follower problem, then this this type of this type of formulation is going to select the among the multiple optimals that the follower is like sure all these solutions are alternative to me the model is going to select the one that is the most favorable to the leader there's also a pessimistic version where it would be wait no if you have alternative optimal solutions then you need to pick the one that is worse for the leader now, in practice, uh, and in many cases, those optimistic and pessimistic assumptions, they only come into play where you actually have like multiple alternative solutions in here. But yes, op optimistic in this case. 
anything else we would like to clarify before moving on? Okay, awesome. So uh, we're working in this paper, as I was telling you, with Andre and David, and we uh, we are looking at mainly two approaches. I want to focus in. Uh, when I was preparing, I, I tried to put both, but it's like now nah, let's let's just focus on one and do it slowly and and just show what's going on. So and there are many ideas in in where we could use decision diagrams in here because we have. Uh, we have an upper level problem, we have a lower level problem, we have uh, two separate but interacting feasible spaces and uh, it's, it's not a clear question of well if, 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 if decision diagrams are going to do something good for us, uh, where they should be, should we try to build a decision diagram for the complete by level problem or maybe to try to do allies, or maybe try to decompose the leader feasible region or the follower, or maybe just focus on the interactions. Like where to start is, is, is actually an in, a very interesting question. And we've been working on this for, a, for a, probably a couple of years now. And, and there's so, so many ideas, so many places where you could say, well, maybe decision diagrams could bring something. Um, in this case, I want to show you an idea where we are using decision diagrams uh, to make a transformation of the follower problem. So we're going to focus on this, the, the most complicating constraint, because if you look at this um, type of bilevel formulation, if you take away the red constraint in here, everything's like pretty vanilla type of optimization. The, the complicating crazy stuff is happening on this constraint that has an argument max. So it's like this constraint that is embedding an optimization problem within an optimization problem. That's This is what is messing everything up. So a, a first natural approach is, well, let's see if we can use decision diagrams to get a, a, to get a hold, a better representation, and, and somehow transform this nasty constraint in here. Now, uh, before I move on also, these problems, even if everything is convex, everything's linear, everything is well behaved, even in the most perfect conditions where everything has all the natural, beautiful structure, these problems are uh, well known to be still MP hard. So even if, if all the functions are convex or linear, all the variables are continuous, like even in the with the best conditions, these problems are MP hard. Now, if on top of that, in, in this setting, we are trying to look at purely discrete, discrete uh, leader, discrete follower, all these problems are like very, very, very challenging. And there are few methods that can actually uh, directly deal with this type of, of, of formulations. And, and one of the complicating factors in here, and this was something that Merv was also um, mentioning in, in her talk, is these discrete variables in the follower. Because if you don't have, if, if your follower problem is some nice LP or convex problem, well, you can you can use duality, you can use convexity, you can use uh, optimality conditions, and there's some things that you could do. However, having all these pure discrete variables in the follower problem, oh, that's that's the nail in the coffin for the difficulty of this set. Uh, Awesome. With that in mind, let me just try to introduce an example here. And um, this is the working example I would use for the rest of the presentation. And it's a, a competitive project selection type of problem. So imagine that you have two companies, I don't know, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and they are uh, competing to execute um, a, a set of projects. So for example, they, they both want to buy uh, ads for the Super Bowl. Maybe, I don't know, Pepsi has like the halftime show and they are like sponsors and what's not. So maybe they can go first and they can pick their, like these are the ads, these are the slots that we want to use. And then it's competitive in the sense that, well, there's only this limited set of projects. In my example, there's only this limited set of ads that you can execute. And, and once the leaders is, is, is buying some of these ads, once the follower goes and tries to, to find their portfolio, then, then the projects that the leader executor are no longer available. So um, also it's competitive in the sense that probably uh, for the leader, 
you may have a revenue, you may have a, a market share that you say, okay, if I invest in, in one of these ads, if I execute one of these projects, you, you get some positive gain. But then also when your competitor is getting a good spot or something, that could have a negative effect on you. So it's not only like I'm the leader, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to maximize my market share. It's like I'm the leader, my decisions could bring, improve or bring some positive effects to my market share. But I also want to consider that my competitor, whenever there's an ad that I don't take, if my competitor takes that ad or executes that project, well, that may have, that might take market share from me or that, that may have a negative effect. So the leader somehow has to balance between the strategic decisions of which projects to select to, to, to maximize his or her um, profit or market share, but also considering that the follower is going to play a role and the follower actions could also affect uh, the performance of the portfolio. In that sense, if I'm going to present here a, a, a little bit simplified formulation for this problem. So again, this is a bi-level problem. We have a leader and a follower. And in this case, the leader, both the leader and the follower, they have binary variables that says one, if I execute a project, zero, if I don't execute a project. And it's a common set of projects. This P is a common set of projects. It's, it's the same set of projects, both for the leader and for the follower. And in this very simple setting, the leader has a budget. So there's, there's some uh, amount of money available to execute projects. And this is a simple knapsack or budget constraint. So a limited budget to execute projects. The follower also has a limited budget to execute projects. And the competitive part and the bi-level part in here is expressed in, in, in the interaction between the, between the two problems. So whenever a leader, whenever the leader selects a project, that project is no longer available for the follower. So we have this type of, and this is a very common structure in the literature that says, look, each one of these follower binary variables that they say, I want to execute a project or not, well, this is less than or equal to one minus the corresponding leader variable. So if the leader is like, no, I don't want to execute the project. Well, the project is available for the follower. But if the leader that plays first selects a project, then immediately the corresponding follower variable has to be set to zero. And again, this type of relationships you see a lot in, in network interdiction and in robust settings. This is, this is a very interesting structure that has been, has been present in many, many papers in the literature. Also, as I was telling you, also the competitive part is, is captured here in the objective. As I was um, describing, sure, there, there may be a profit, a market share, uh, something to gain for the, for the leader investment in these projects, but then uh, we can capture a negative effect of for the projects that the leader is not selecting. Once the competitor executes some of those projects, there may be a negative effect in the leader's objective. Awesome. So decision diagrams. This is the part where I would normally spend like 10 or 15 minutes introducing the decision diagrams and the formulations. But at, at this point in the school, Something that we all know, and the reason we are so happy in here sharing these ideas is because decision diagrams provide a awesome, compact, a convex flow type of formulation to represent a discrete spaces. Uh, discrete optimization problems could be transformed into longest or shortest path problems on graphs that could grow exponentially in size, sure, but a, if you're able to build these graphs, they provide a nice, well-structured representation of otherwise a unstructured, non-convex, discrete type of spaces. How we could use this here? Well, hmm, this is again not straightforward because this follower problem is not a standalone problem. This follower problem is directly controlled by the decisions made by the leader. So in order to define a follower problem, I need to be able to see a vector of leader decisions. Once you tell me, OK, those are the decisions that the leader made, made then that defines what are the decisions that the follower can make. So in general, what we're saying is 
this is an optimization problem that is control is parameterized by the actions of the leader. Like there's an external vector that is controlling the feasibility and for different vectors, then there could be some feasible solutions that are feasible for some vectors and are not feasible for other vectors. So constructing this decision diagram is not straightforward and it's, it's not absolutely clear how to incorporate this parameterization. What we're doing, it's again, it's, it's, a, it's building on the ideas of, of the ideas that we had before and that we've been doing in the past few years for, um, for two stages stochastic programming. This is an extension, this is an adaptation. And it's again, a, trying to notice that if we look at the feasible space of this follower problem, this feasible space has two components. There are some constraints in our example, it's a simple knapsack constraint that uh, it's not dependent on the leader variables. Independently of whatever the leader selects or doesn't select, the follower has a budget and the follower has a limitation in here that has nothing to do with the leader. On the other hand, there is these interactions that the ones that I, I, I'm going to call like the linking constraints, the ones that are, are gluing these two problems together, the interactions between when the leader is making a decision, these constraints are the ones that are actually changing my feasible space and are the ones that are actually connecting the two problems together. The idea then, and the, the idea I want to share and the, 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 the approach we're following it's, well, let's consider these two separate uh, components of the problem, like in two different phases. Like maybe first we could completely ignore these linking constraints. Sure, let's forget about the leader for a second. If, if, if we ignore these linking constraints for a second, we just simply have like, all those constraints that don't depend on the leader. In this case, we just have a simple knapsack constraint. This is something that we know perfectly how to build a decision diagram to represent. So you give me a knapsack constraint, this knapsack constraint, I can build a decision diagram in which every path in this diagram has a one-to-one -one corresponding to a solution that satisfies the constraint. Easy peasy. Now, what is really interesting here is that Technically, this is an exact decision diagram. Like we are exactly encoding all the feasible solutions to this constraint. However, in this bi-level context, since we are ignoring all the linking constraints, this exact decision diagram that is exactly encoding the remaining constraints somehow becomes a relaxed decision diagram for the follower problem. This is just capturing everything that the follower could ever do, ignoring the decisions of the leader. This is a superset, or this would be the union of all the possible realizations of the feasible space of the follower problem. So once I ignore these linking constraints, I'm saying for any possible vector, any possible vector in a binary space of P dimensions, these are all the possible the responses that could ever happen. So this exact decision diagram that is exactly encoding the follower constraints is in some way a relaxed decision diagram for the follower. That makes sense? Sweet. Once we're at this point, then we can again use this type of trick of a sure, we have this super space, we have this decision diagram that captures everything that could ever happen. Now we can incorporate the uh, leader decision variables into uh, as capacities into these arcs so that we control which parts of the diagram are accessible or not with the uh, leader decision vector. And this is again, I think core part of the core of the contribution of this idea as well. Once you have this decision diagram, you can control how this decision diagram is going to represent different feasible sets by introducing capacities on the arcs. In this case, what we have to do is go layer by layer. And then in the first layer, every one arc that would, the, every one arc that would imply a follower uh, decision variable being equal to one, 
Now we impose a capacity of one minus the corresponding leader variable. So leader says zero, I don't want to take the project. Well, the arc is available for the follower and the follower has the ability to take the arc or not. If the leader say, yes, I want to take the project, for every project that the leader executes, then the capacity of this arc becomes zero and then it's like, it's no longer available for the follower. In the second layer, now I have to put the capacity on both one arcs. And for each one of these layers, I would have to put the capacity on every single one arc. However, interestingly enough, in this case, uh, zero arcs won't have any capacity. Like the, there's, there's nothing that the leader can do to force the follower to, to avoid saying no to a project. So um, the leader can only influence or only affect the capacity of the one arcs in this case. Now, what is really cool about this gadget is that now we have this diagram that we, we, we still don't define a name. We, we call this like parametric decision diagram or maybe a flexible decision diagram or adjustable decision diagram. This is a decision diagram that is, is not like the traditional decision diagram with everything static. This is a decision diagram that it receives an, an input, it receives a vector of, of, of leader variables in this case. And for, for a given vector that you give me that sets up different capacities over the arcs, and for any given vector that you give me, the solution space represented for this variable, for this it represented by this decision diagram is changing. So you give me one vector, a vector full of ones, then the follower has nothing else to do, just go all zeros. You give me a, a vector zero, zero, one. Okay, so the follower can select any of the projects except the third one, and you get the point. This, this diagram is for any input that you give me, the input being the vector of decision, of leader decisions, then this diagram is going to accurately enforce or encode the uh, corresponding follower feasible space. Why? I'm making such a big deal and what I am excited about this. Well, because once we have a representation like this one, then instead of having to deal with this arc max of a purely discrete problem that's discrete, non-convex, no wild, wild west, no special properties, nothing like, like, like purely combinatorial expression, I can transform that into, and I, I guess we have seen this almost every day in these talks, I, I can transform that into a nice, beautiful flow formulation over the diagram. Now, this flow formulation has an additional component because these uh, arcs, they have capacities. So if you see here, we have the typical flow balance, but now we have some capacities, capacities only on the one arcs, and these capacities are controlled by an external, this, in this problem, this is not a variable. In this problem, this is fixed. So you give me, you give me a fixed vector of leader, uh, the plan for the leader. And once you fix that, uh, that controls, and, and this is just a constant, this is still a beautiful uh, primal uh, network flow formulation. Now, of course, if I'm calling this primal, you know exactly where I'm going. If, if I have this formulation, then I can look also at a dual and I can start looking at so many things. And now I'm, I'm very happy because I, I can start using again techniques that you usually use only in the convex setting. Now I can use this in the same way as in the previous talk. It's like, look, in the original form, there's no vendors decomposition. There's nothing you can do. There's, this is just a discrete problem. But after the transformation, then you can apply vendors, you can apply costs, you can, it's the same idea here. Before the transformation, we just have this ugly, well, not ugly, it's very nice, but, but not a structured, purely discrete problem. After the transformation, now we have a flow problem, we have a, we have a primal, we have a dual, and we have some properties that I want to show you very nice properties. If we think about this, uh, of course, even after the transformation, this primal problem is still dependent on the leader variables. It's parameterized by the leader variables. This feasible region depends. You give me a, a fixed vector of leader variables, and this feasible region is shifting with the leader variables. However, 
Once we go to the dual, something nice is happening here and it's in the dual problem. The leader variables are only here messing up with the objective, but the dual feasible space uh, is not changing, is, is in no way, shape or form affected by the uh, leader decisions, which means that somehow all the possible dual problems for all the possible choices of the leader and the follower, the feasible uh, space in the dual, the feasible dual space remains the same. So there's like only one feasible dual space you care about. Whereas in the primal space, for, for any realization of, of these leader variables, your primal space is changed. What we can do here again is we could go the, the route of, okay, from here, maybe we can design a cutting plane algorithm. Uh, but actually I want to take another route and we're exploring another route in here. And it's, if we have primal, dual, uh, we have optimality conditions. So maybe what we can now do is to use KKT continuity conditions to try to come up with a single level reformulation now. If you've been in this area uh, or you, you've heard anything about robust optimization or interdiction or any of these by level settings, this is by no means our contribution. This is the, this is the type of approaches that you traditionally use when your problem is convex and well behaved. In this case, what binary decision diagrams are doing for us is they are a convexification gadget, a convexification device by which we can go from a purely discrete problem into a nice uh, convex network flow type of uh, follower problem into uh, the existence and, and, and it opens the door for us to use KKT conditions and reformulations and what's not. In this case, uh, we can express the KKT conditions as three ideas. One, well, you need a flow, you need a path on the, on the diagram. So primal feasibility is just, this is, a, this is a problem over decision diagram. You need to find a path from root node to end node in the diagram. Then dual feasibility is interesting as I was telling you, you just need a vector pi and alpha that satisfy these constraints and dual feasibility here, it has nothing to do with the leader. So primal feasibility, it has something to do with the leader. The leader is changing the primal space. Dual feasibility is just, <coughs> find me uh, pi and alpha that <coughs> is going to satisfy the dual constraints. And then the complicating part is the complementary slackness or strong duality. <coughs> We would want to say, look, the relationship between these two solutions, primal and dual, it's that the, the objective function of the primal has to be equal to the objective function of the dual. Mm. <clears throat> Why this could be a um, concern is because if we're trying to mix and match everything into a single level formulation, these leader variables, whenever they're just a fixed vector, Okay, nobody cares. It's just like constants. However, if we just want to put everything together, the primal, the dual, and the leader, everything together in one big problem, whenever these XL stop being just constants and go back to being variables, then we have this term in here. And this term in here is, is not fun because this would be a binary variable times a continuous dual. So it's, it's not only a quadratic term, but it's a multiplication of binary times continuous. Uh, and sure, maybe you could say, no, you can linearize, you can use McCormick, but this, this type of, of, this, this type of uh, terms uh, usually end up weakening your formulations. What is actually really, really, really cool, and I, 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 I won't show you the details. I'll, this is like my selling point for you to eventually look for the paper is, this is not only any primal and any dual. This is a primal over a decision diagram and there has, there's nothing in the world that has more structure than a decision diagram. This decision diagram, you know it has layers, you know that each layer corresponds to a specific variable, you know that it's directed, you know that it has no cycles. There are so many nice properties in this decision diagram that when you stop for a second and you start looking at what could happen with paths in the diagram, 
And what could happen with corresponding uh, dual, or some people call these node potentials for the paths. And after some analysis on the structure of the diagram and the structure of the primal solutions and the dual solutions, and with some very, 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 very mild assumptions, because of the structure of the diagram, because of the, of the relationship of every layer corresponds to a specific variable and all the beautiful things that happen with the diagram, actually we can uh, recast this strong duality without the need of having this, um, uh, this annoying multiplication in here. We can alternatively enforce a strong duality by just ensuring that the, the objective function for the primal is equal to this transformation. This is just like a linearization of the dual objective in which we got rid of the multiplication of the dual variable times the binary variable, and we just split the terms. And this is a very, very nice result that is only achievable because of the structure of the diagram. Now, what is really cool is using that diagram, we got the representation, we got the KKT conditions, and now instead of having this type of bi-level, one problem within one problem, and, and, and this, this complicated type of, of a, a formulation, after the whole transformation, we get, this looks complicated, but this, this is not. This is just a traditional single level, mixed integer optimization problem in this case. What we have is the leader variables. Instead of the follower, now we have primal over the decision diagram and dual. And we are just putting everything together, like one big soup, one big cocktail of a problem. So we have the, we have the, the leader constraints. We have the primal constraints. I have this selected because the decision diagram part is hidden inside here. So this, this is just saying, find me a path in the decision diagram. And then we would have dual constraints and the linear relationship I was telling you. And this is something that you can input directly into Simplex or Godoy or any of the shelf solver of reference. Sweet. Um, I want to show you some computational experiments. This could be also a good point of, uh, are there any common questions up to this, up to this point? Awesome. So we uh, built an experimental setup uh, for this specific example. We are looking at 30, 40, and 50 projects. And uh, to define the tightness or the, the budget constraints, what we did is to define this parameter omega. And uh, we say, look, what would be the complete, the total cost of executing all the projects? And we're going to set up the budget as omega times this summation in here. So intuitively, if I say omega is 0 0.1, what this means is roughly both the leader and the follower have enough money to execute 10% of their projects. If I go all the way and I say omega equals one, it would mean that both the leader and the follower, it just becomes trivial. Like both the leader and the follower would have enough money to execute absolutely everything in the project pool. So uh, we coded this in Java. We're using Cplex to solve all the optimization problems in here. And we're going to compare three different approaches. The first approach, it's a, a value function reformulation. And this, is a, this was my first project, my introduction to bi-level problems. This is a paper with Cole, my advisor, from 2017. And in that moment, like four years ago, with the settings and the, the, the test bits that we were using, this value function reformulation was computationally was very competitive and we had very good results. And since I have the source code, it's like, sure, let's, let's see how we compare that against this. It's like a general approach for bi-level problems. Then uh, in the same year, uh, there's uh, this other paper also in OR by Fischietti et al. And they propose and I would say this is like the state of the art for linear bi-level problems. They have a solver. It's, it's a bi-level solver that is based on branch and code and computational. I'm, I'm just so glad that I got to publish my paper the year that I did 
because then these faults they came with their solver and it's like wow like the the, the computational performance and I've, even today if you look at the wide level literature I, I would say this is probably as a general solver is is the best performer of course for for some specific problems if you exploit the specific structures then it's it's you can you can do better but as a general solver this is a this is a, a very very good benchmark and now um I just have our decision diagram reformulation. And what is cool about our decision diagram reformulation is that you just have to build a reformulation. And then this reformulation, you just put it just like that. You just dump it into CPLEX just like that. Mm, OK, so what's going on here? First, the sad part for me, sad news is this, this, this value function reformulation that uh, I, I'm still so proud about. It, it had a terrible performance in these instances. Um, you can see here when there's only 30 projects and the budget is very tight, well, awesome, solve super fast. But with very small increments here in, in, in as, the, as the budget gets looser, as you get more budget, quickly it comes to a point where this uh, approach is not even able to solve any instance. And it's not only that it's not solving, but after one hour of computation, the remaining uh, computational gap is still massive. And if we go down here, this is sad. Like look at 50, 50 projects, this solver is not, is not able to close any instance. Everything hits the time limit and all the remaining optimality gaps are very, very high. Now, this is also a reminder that, well, as I was telling you at the beginning, a bi-level discrete optimization problem, this is, this is as hard as they come. Like only 50 projects, and we are, this is already too much for this, for this approach to solve. So th these problems are very difficult. There's, there's no escaping that. Even for small n, these problems are, are very, very difficult. That's not escaping that. And then of course, this uh, this solver is it has a, a better performance, at least for n equals 30, this is perfect, it's solving everything. For n equals 40, solving almost everything, and it has a little bit of gap with the instances with uh, larger uh, budgets. But then again, for n equals 50, uh, you can see how this degrades. No, for a tight, tight uh, omega, perfect, 30 seconds, everything solved. But as omega grows, it's like eh, the solver start failing, failing. And again, when we have 50 eh, projects, omega equals 25%, this solver is not able to close any of the instances. Now the optimality gaps are better than, than my value function approach, but still, still quite, eh, quite interesting gaps in here. Awesome news is that in this case, our, our decision diagram reformulation, uh, well, when there's a small number of projects, it's still very good, very competitive. And you can see how these times are scaling way better than the other approaches. Even here with 50, with 50 projects on the line, uh, we are still able to solve everything except one instance. And that one instance, uh, the optimality gap is pretty reasonable. So overall, I was, and we were very excited with these, with these results. Actually, they, they are really good. And, and uh, then I put them in the paper and Andre is like, no, Leo, those results look too good. Maybe we should find also other instances. And funny story is that, okay, Let's, let's try to find other instances. Let's try to find other parameterizations to see. Uh, it's going to be interesting to find where the bi-level solver or, or, the, or any of the other approaches when the decision diagram formulation is going to fail. My first intuition is, well, we know that these decision diagrams, they grow in size. Uh, and, and then maybe as we keep increasing n, well, the size of these diagrams is going to grow too large, and maybe that's where the method is going to fail. However, as we keep increasing n, sure, eventually the decision diagram method is going to fail, but these other methods are completely failing before. So it's like decision diagrams is going to fail, but it's, 
it, it's, it's not like with larger n decision diagram is going to fail and the bilevel solver is going to work. So the other idea was, okay, maybe what we want to do is to keep going at, at uh, larger and larger values of these larger and larger values of these budget constraint. And the behavior is super interesting. It's like these problems are getting more difficult, more difficult, more difficult, more difficult. But then once you have enough budget, then it's like the leader has a lot of power. So the leader can just execute most of the projects. And then once, once the budget is like 60, 70%, it's like difficult, 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 difficult. And then it goes and the problems becomes very, very, very easy. So uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, I think that we are we are almost finding a, a place where maybe these decision diagrams could fail, but it's it's not messing with the it's not messing with the size or the or the budget, but it's more messing like with the the distribution of the weights in this knapsack. And um, long story short, what I'm happy is that sure this table looks amazing. And then all the other experiments we have been doing is like, sure, the still the method is, is very good. It's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's been a challenge to find a set of instances where we can show that, okay, here is where the decision diagram method is failing. And I would guess it's, it's just simply because a, any method that is dealing with this problem directly it has to deal with a bi-level structure. It has to deal with, with, with relaxations, with cuts, with like, it, this is a bi-level world, whereas our method, once you get to this point, this is a single level problem. And nowadays, Gurovi and Ciplex, they are so effective at solving single level problems that once you're back in the, in the world of single level optimization, a, a solver is going to perform amazingly good. Also, something else that is interesting and is the usual critique that we always get and it's like, oh yeah, but decision diagrams, eh, they are going to grow exponential in size. Sure, we know they are. However, these problems are so difficult that even with exact decision diagrams, we, we, are, we are not using relaxed decision diagrams, we're not using constraint. These are exact decision diagrams. But these problems are so, so, so difficult that, that, that even in this case, we can afford, we can have, we can perfectly use exact decision diagrams and, and have orders of magnitude if improvement over previous methods from the literature as these problems are so difficult that, 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 that it's not of a concern yet that the size of the decision diagrams is going to grow too, too large. So, Okay, this is all I have for today. The, the main takeaway, the main idea, uh, and as Merv was saying, if you are looking for topics, if you want to continue this type of, of research, I say something that is very useful and that is really cool is to understand decision diagrams as these convexification devices. Like decision diagrams could be a way of taking something that has no structure and transforming it into a nice convex structure type of, extra, of, of setting. And then once you convexify, convexify these spaces, you get access to many of the tools and ideas from convex optimization that are there. What's interesting in this type of settings is uh, these are a special type of decision diagrams where uh, there's capacities on the arcs and these capacities on the arcs, they are the ones playing the crucial role of making these diagrams flexible, adjustable, parametric is, is because of these capacities in the arcs that we can link the bi-level, the leader, the follower, and, and we can do the stuff that we do. And in this specific work, the key, the key component is that once we use the decision diagrams, that allows us to, to get access to a KKT dualized and combined type of reformulation. And it's, it's been very promising. What comes next, and the, this is a question that is, is in the back of my mind, and it's, it's a very interesting open question is, well, we are using exact decision diagrams, but as we know, eventually, if we want this to keep scaling into more complex and larger problems, we'll have to move from exact decision diagrams into relaxed or restricted decision diagrams at some point. However, 
in this setting, it's not as simple as a straightforward as in a single level setting. No, in a, in a single level setting, we say exact decision diagram is an exact representation, gives you an optimal solution. Relax is going to give you a uh, upper or lower bound. Restricted is going to be a heuristic and it's going to give you a bound. Yeah, but here in a bi-level setting, well, if we say we're going to use a relaxed decision diagram to transform the follower problem, sure, the relaxed decision diagram now is giving me a relaxation of the follower, but in the bi-level setting, that is not that it translates immediately to a valid relaxation of the problem or bounds. Like if I relax the follower, now it means that the follower has more power that he should have and how that affects the leader and how from a relaxation of the follower or a restriction of the follower, can I still uh, obtain feasible, bi-level feasible solutions? It's, it's not straightforward. And I think it's the same case in two stages stochastic programming. Like if you use a relaxation for the recourse, okay, you, you, there's some things that you could use in there, but it's not as straightforward as, 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 as exactly how to incorporate this, uh, where in this, in, in, in this process, you could incorporate a relaxation or restriction, how they come into play, I don't know. And I think we, we have to go here next, definitely, as, as we explore these ideas, uh, eventually, we need to move from exact decision diagrams into relaxed and, and restricted. Of course, I think it's, it's, a, it's a natural evolution in a topic. No, we, we start exploring a topic. Maybe we get some results. We get some papers working with exact decision diagrams. Once we really understand how this is working, then we can take it a step, a step further and, and go with relaxation, what's not. Other ideas in there is, well, we're working with single decision diagrams, but uh, David here, and Andre, they are the pioneers in this idea of using multiple decision diagrams at the same time. And that opens a whole other world of possibilities. And the same discussion we were having before is also the question of how general could we push this linking constraints? In this case, we are exploiting this special structure in this example. In the paper, we exploit a, a very general, but still it, it's a general, it, it's way more general than this, but still we have some assumptions on how is it that this problem interact. And I guess that's that's a very open, very interesting question. How, how general, how different, how this interaction between the leader and the follower, how can we still capture that as capacities on the arcs on how can we still if it's with indicator functions, or if it's as this gets, as these interactions get more complicated, how this scales and how the design of these diagrams still holds, it's it's a it's an open question still that I think is worth uh, looking. So, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, I think we have still some time for questions, comments. Uh, I'm happy to discuss. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, any questions from anybody? Okay, go ahead, Mosin. Oh, no, that, that, that was not a question. That was just oh, you're just clapping. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm so excited to give you a good clap. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was just thinking while you were talking, the relaxations are so interesting, right? Because if you were to solve the problem with a relaxed DD, just as this, right? But you a relaxed... But you a, relax get a relaxed solution, right? I mean, you get a relaxation, no? But you know, but that, this is the ah, this is the this is why this gets so messy, because let's say that you use a relaxed DD, you're Not making a relaxation of this arc max. Yeah. But but the problem the, the problem is not this arc max in here. The problem is this outer problem in here. Yeah. So you are relaxing the follower inside, but then th that is actually not ensuring. And, and this is a, a well-known result in, in bi-level programming because it's the same with a linear relaxation. You could say, oh, I'm going to take the linear relaxation. Yeah, but that's useless because a linear relaxation of the follower is not getting you anything in terms of the bi-level bi nature. Now, maybe what we could do or maybe what you could do is maybe first you need to somehow get the bi-level structure out of the way, like massage this where you remove that R max out of the way, 
and then you use a relaxation, but then the relaxation is on a problem that is actually going to give you a bound or something. Right, so the relaxation on the actual single level formulation, but you know, that's a totally different idea, yeah. Oh yeah. Huh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Obviously very promising, so thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you again, Leo. Awesome. Excellent no, talk. Thank um, you for the invitation and thank you for, I, I've been attending, uh, I, I haven't been able to attend all the talks, but I, I've been attending the, the most I can. And this is awesome. Thank you for organizing. This is, this is so nice. Of course. And Andre, we have what? One more talk tomorrow. Is that it? We have uh, two more talks. We have two. Okay. We awesome. have uh, Arvind and Carlos. Very exciting cool. talks. Yes. Multilinear programming and multi-object optimization where uh, Merv is also one of the co-authors. Awesome stuff. All right.